Our guest is John Michael Cummings, and he's written a book called The Spirit in My Shoes. He's a resident of Harper's Ferry. John Michael, good morning to you, sir. How are you? I am fine. Thank you. How are you? Excellent. Uh, I have a fellow author in studio with me and John Gilstrap. Uh, I always like to uh, bring on authors when John is on because I, I like to get that uh, mojo, that chemistry author mojo stuff going here. Tell us a little bit about your book, The Spirit in My Shoes, John Michael. I will. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It, I'm really grateful to you. Uh, I have 23 short stories in this volume, this collection. 23 short stories. It's about 200 pages. It's published by University of Wisconsin and Cornerstone Press. These are really great short stories that I've written over the last 15 to 20 years. And they vary in length, they vary in setting, and in writing style, too. So. Uh, one story was nominated, two stories actually were nominated for the Pushcart Prize, which is pretty coveted, as well as one story was an honorable mention in the Best American Short Story series. So it's, it's really, if a book can, ha can be a calling card, this is mine, because it's a, it's a really a great sample of some of the work I've done. Over how many years did you write this collection of short stories that came uh, to be this book? Probably 20. So they, years. do these reflect yeah. different yeah. Mm -hmm. different points in your life, different places where you where you were in your life? Well, um, yes, it's not a travel log though. You know, this is some are set in Jefferson County, and some are in Fairfax County, and a few are in Providence, Minneapolis, as well as Orlando. So they're places I've been, but each has its own setting and is is deeply rooted in the place as well as the characters and the culture. So. Um, I, I like that because there, it's involved work. It required research. It required editing and some fine writing that, you know, to be placed in top journals like the Kenyon Review. One story is in the Kenyon Review. Another is in the North American Review. And the third is in the Iowa Review. Now, those are, those are the three best, really. And I'm really proud of that. I mean, so, yeah, it's a wonderful feeling. And, yeah, very nice. I'm, you know, I'm truly grateful. And, for the, for and, the, and John Michael, why was now the time to put this particular collection together into book form? Um, it just happened that way. I mean, I, I did put them together, but it just it just so happened that the publisher liked it and had an opportunity for it. And that's often how it will work. You know, I have tried to plan when a story will be published or when I can place it and where. But it usually is by it require it involves other elements such as chance, uh, you know, the style of writing, the particular editor who reads it. So I just had some good luck happen, and and we arranged the stories, and so I'm really going to make the most of it, and uh, I'm really proud of it. And uh, these are hard earned and well placed and really well written too. And for all ages, I think anyone who can read, say, at a third or fourth grade level could appreciate a couple of these stories that have a narrator who's young. Well, that, Other stories are a little little more, have more emotional involvement in a complex adult character. Those might be a little harder for a younger reader to grasp, but I think the writing is very accessible, and yet it is, it is well done in that it, ha, it is at times spare writing, so it, it is an open style, easy to read, but it is, um, it is, it has a polished, it has a positive restraint to the language. Mm -hmm. By that I mean it allows the reader to, to place in their image in the sentence. So it's open enough that it breathes. And uh, that's a great writing style. Like a fine wine. Especially for short fiction. Yeah. Pardon? Like a fine wine. Mm -hmm. It breathes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that. some of these are written at a third and fourth grade level so Corey and I can understand those. And then Gilstrap with his wow. William and Mary education can read that erudite <laughs> well, stuff that's kind of at the top of the food chain. John Michael's a Jefferson County native. So did you go to Jefferson High School? I did, yes. Jefferson yeah. High School. So I graduated I mean, in 19. Mm -hmm. I would think we were yeah. probably on the same wavelength, at least third grade. Corey went to Jefferson High School, too. Yeah, I think we could at least get to third grade. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> more importantly, I went to Harper Story Junior High. Oh, nice. But it was called a junior high. <laughs> That's right. Hey, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Gilstrap, your fellow so, author. First of all, is it John or John Michael? John Michael. John Michael. John Michael. Uh, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the stories themselves. The uh, There's, um, what is it, how many? 20? 
23. 23 stories. So is there a common thread, a common theme? Are, are we talking mysteries? Are they romances? Are they kind of give us a thought no, about what mean, the, the, the body of the story is. Stories. What does that mm-hmm. mean? Uh, when I say mainstream, I mean they're, they're grounded in everyday life. They're realistic. It's a realism to them. There is, they are realistically drawn, and there's, uh, there is a gritty reality to them. So it's not, um, it's not fantastic, not fantastic and unbelievable. The stories just step right into a setting that, that most of us experience, you know, for, you know, from work to home to our love life to health. So the stories just, you know, are incidents. In some cases, they are small moments in the life of a character, and other times uh, they involve several months, even years. So, but they are, I would say that they're definitely grounded in reality. So, I mean, it's the thing that we all say happens. You know, we get older. We all know we get older. We all know we get, you know, we've fallen in and out of love. These are things that we can relate to. You and I, and other, and everyone, and so those stories are come to that conversation, in that relatable conversation, and that's how I've written. So you're more John Updike than you are Michael Connolly. <laughs> you mentioned John Updike. <laughs> well, I mean, that's uh, I like the, that's the epitome of of you know sort of everyday life challenges, you know, living living yeah. life. Yeah, he was, was a great short story writer and one of my favorites um but no my style is not his it's not so artful and dense as some of his work was this is a more um you know a freer a more spare style so more um more like cormac mccarthy you know than john updike or more like even hemingway than updike so I'm trying to get so, an idea um, of, of, of I'm trying to help you sell books here. So what the the stories themselves every, every day can can you kind of give us a peek into some of the the plot that who the character course. the character yes, wants I this, you can't, you know, that kind of stuff for one of the stories, the lead story to. perhaps. Well, yes, um, you know, in one story set in Rhode Island, a couple has to uh, a couple moves to uh, a very nice neighborhood in Rhode Island on the shore. And they are living nearby a man they think is an old time sailor, you know, somebody, an old salt from the sea. He is dressed that way. And yet they are just observant and not so friendly, but just watching him. And as the reader, we get to see how much that means to them, that he is part of that comfort feeling of their having moved to the, the shore and it's what they want to see. It's the illusion they create. And this is a big thing about our lives. We do create illusions all the time and we feed them. So they have the illusion that he is the, an old salt sailor. Well, they discover later that he's not. He actually works at the YMCA and he's, he's actually really fit. But he, in the story, he's wearing a jacket that they cannot see beyond that heavy, um, sailor's jacket he has on so so for that that is an example of the illusions that we constantly build up whether we are alone by ourselves or in a relationship and those can be popped very easily and yet we live from these bubbles of projected reality and and we live there in in what is not a very it's not a verified reality we're no, we're not really interacting that much with our physical reality. We see people, but we're not stepping into their area and touching them. So we're really just the result of this eye organ, you know, our optics, our sight, to, um, you know, to to not just be caught up in the illusion of the image. So uh, does that help you? I mean, does that give you something? As as I'm explaining it, does that help? Sure. Uh, okay. I'm just what I just wanted to do. All right, Mr. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Rum. Yeah, no, I I really like that response oh. there. Um, how how did you come to to being an author of of short stories rather than rather than long form? Now I saw that you do have I think it's it's two or three um, long 
long form novels three yeah. um why mm -hmm. why is the bulk of your work short stories and tell me what what really um interests you with that because our lives are not well plotted our lives have are there's so much happenstance in our life so many chance moments we do not have a cohesive plot to our life we some we try but there are things we cannot control we have to come to grips with the fact that we are a, an individual in a society and what our wishes are are our subjective wishes what we want personally as we live as we grow older as we accumulate accomplishments we want that but a society has its own reality too so you know for me we don't live by novels we live by short stories we live by op-eds. We live by uh, little essays and half write-ups now. Our journalism is, is very thin. It, it, you know, in most cases, the stories that we see are very brief. And um, I think that's a big way, uh, it, my, it, uh, to say it differently, my eyes seem to work that way. What has bothered me in life are these things that I cannot understand that happen from moment to moment, the way people half interact, the way they say things and neither understands the other, but the third person in the group does understand. So there's just a constant amusement all the time. Uh, you know, just things are very amusing. If you have, a, if you look at it with a lighter spirit, it's because it must be amusing because it's out of our control. That's our coping mechanism is to make it feel amusing or absurd. But so much is uh, disjointed. And so my Sweet. I've always enjoyed short fiction. I've had a knack with it, a knack for it. Uh, it it's not so hard for me to publish short stories. And um, it's just been in my wheelhouse, the short narrative, because intense. In the short narrative, you can have a suspended moment without a plot. It can be entirely atmospheric. It can be a, a melancholic moment. It could be laughter. All of this is kind of, um, you know, that is, a, that is like a micro-reality. And if the writer is skilled enough and polished and disciplined and works hard with editing and, and get, accepts feedback, can capture reality in words as well as the language will hold it. You know, we we have a little bit of constraints in our language with a lot of our sentence structures. So it's a great thing to, to take language, you know, mm -hmm. a quarter of a million words, <laughs> probably in the dictionary, to take what you need out of that and, and to build um, a, a recreation of a moment or to take what should have happened. Many times in life we are cursed with having to cope with what happened rather than what should have happened. And that's what, that is kind of the hopeful, optimistic bane of our existence in a way. We want what should have happened. So stories can be a way of, of saying what should have happened. And that, and brings... that is a delight. That is a delight to the reader because it's not, it does depart a little bit from reality. Yes, it's, it's the attraction of the Quentin Tarantino alternate ending to Inglorious Bastards, right? And uh, what was the other one we were talking about? Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Right. right. Right? It's what should have happened as opposed to what did happen. And I think a lot of people don't realize. And I'd rather live in what should have happened as opposed to what did happen. It's happier that way. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, cut you off. I, I take that. I take that advice from the great novelist Joyce Carol Oates. So mm -hmm. that's that was one way she put it, very directly to her yeah. students. John Michael, you, you speak my language, man. I, 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 the last two points that you made before that one, I, you, you're right. We coexist with seven billion people on this planet, or eight, whatever the number is now, but we do it with our eyes as opposed to the rest of our senses. Correct. Right. Correct. And and, and the absurdity of life and, and us thinking we can control it and take it seriously until something comes along that makes you realize you have no control over what's going on out there. So why stress over it? Good, Mr. Gilstrap. No, I just going. It's, it's an entirely different skill set. Writing a short story is 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 as different from writing a novel or a screenplay as you know and any other different you know practicing dentistry versus trauma surgery you know it's, it's really an entirely different skill set that, mm -hmm. that goes in in into structuring yeah, the different versions one scene right one scene that is highly staged 
when I say state, that is a kind of an editor's comment, stage it. I mean, bring it into a scene and shine lights on it so that the reader can see it up close. And it usually, I mean, the most successful stories, I think, are very intensely realistic in that respect. And they are, they can be brief, quite brief. Uh, John Michael, you also wrote a book uh, in, in, uh, in about John Brown. And because you are a Harper's Ferry resident, I have to believe, and I, I know you're fifth generation, John Brown plays a big part of everybody who's been born and raised in Harper's Ferry's lives just because of the simple history of it. It's called The Night I Freed John Brown. Can you tell me about that? Is that, was, is that John uh, Brown? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to tell you about that. I'm very proud of that, that novel. It was my debut novel. It was published by Penguin. And it tells the story of a boy growing up in Harpers Ferry, a native. So it is autobiographical, and it's written first person. So there's no, um, you know, it's not thinly disguised as fiction. It, it feels like it's a real story. Uh, and he's growing up, dealing with a difficult relationship with his father, and he finds in John Brown that archetype, defiant, uh, rebellious um, X factor in life, in, in John Brown, the X factor in breaking the law to change the law. He's, so he discovers in that a great paradox. And he just, he acts out the courage of John Brown in the story and he imbues that into his character and he, you know, he begins to take charge of his life a little bit. So it was a use of history as a kind of taking it as a narrative tool, a story in history and using that in the present cool. and flipping the roles. So, you know, the young, white lad in the story is kind of enslaved by his own fear and his own emotions. So this, you know, what writers do, we try to be cool. <laughs> we try to be artful and smart. <laughs> and sometimes we, you know, if we have a good editor, we can get the story that in that direction, that, that quality. But, you know, literary tropes are is the name of the game, how well you describe, how well your dialogue is, uh, it, you know, what is the so what of the story? That's always the big question. What, why am I reading this? So what? And if you can answer that, you've got it. And it provided you discipline, you're very disciplined in your writing and editing and expanding your, not your vocabulary, but your sense of what is a similar word that is brighter than the one you've been using. So. You know, we have synonyms, and that's not to build us up to the sounding verbose, at least not in literary fiction. It's just providing a word that is very colorful, but right beside the one that is a little overused. So, you know, that's, that's another thing, working laterally with language, going out and finding the, the adjective or the noun that is a beautiful substitute, but has the same clarity and accessibility as the one you've used. John Michael, so, we are just... You know, a Go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish your mm -hmm. sentence. I was going to tell you we're just about out of time, but go ahead and finish your sentence. <laughs> Thank you for cutting me off. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't, the news so, would soon. Yeah. Hey, where do we where do we find your books, John Michael? Tell us where we can find your books. Well, it's uh, it's every available book outlet. So it's uh, you know it's through um, Amazon, of course, and the main. Ingram, I think, is a distributor. So it's Barnes and Noble, anywhere you want to find it. Um, you know, it's LinkedIn. So very good. The spirit in my mm -hmm. shoes. So, yes. The latest one from John yes. Michael Cummings. John Michael, thank you for being on the program today. We enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very grateful. Have a great day, sir.